whether you buy your Hermes bag for 10,000, I'm not sure if a Hermes bag is 10,000 ringgit, but let's say it is. <laughs> Instead of pay, you know, you used to pay 10,000 ringgit, now you have to pay 13,000 ringgit, let's say. To rich people, it's, you know, it's really nothing. Right? It was a Tiffany ring, so you know how much mm -hmm. it costs, right? All ladies know. It's the dream ring. So instead of buying it here in Bukit Bintang, he flew to Switzerland and buy it. Hi, so today we have MJ in Hello. our studio here. So MJ, maybe you can uh, introduce yourself a bit to our audience. Who are you and I noticed that you are from FIRL, which I just learned to be pronounced as FIRL. Yeah, my, my name is uh, MJ. I run a YouTube channel and FIRL is pronounced FIRL. Uh, most people get it wrong. Fur. So I don't, yeah, most people say FIRL. Uh, and, you know, it's short form for finance in real life. Yeah, we mainly talk about stock investing, um, the markets and things like that. I see. Okay, okay. It's talking about stock investment, and then because we have just have our twenty twenty four budget out, That's right. so what I learned from that is that maybe you can enlighten our audience a bit on the stock market, uh, the stock market outlook. Yes. Next year, because I learned that this what the imposition of CGT capital yes. gain tax does it? How does it affect? There are two parts to your question. The first is the mm. the outlook, and the second is the CGT. So on the first part we should expect lower than expected uh, growth from GDP. 2022 was pushed to close to 8, eight over percent GDP growth, mainly driven by consumption in the economy. And that consumption was driven by the government allowing people, Malaysians, to take money out of EPF uh, oh. to spend. A big chunk of that was spent on daily necessities, uh, the other chunk was spent on more fun things, you know. Uh, to give a, an anecdote, I have friends who own uh, motorcycle repair shops and things like that. There was a big spike in demand for people modding their bikes, buying new bikes and things like that. So all this contributes to a higher GDP. Uh, so that made the government look quite good in 2022, the, the two, both governments. But then uh, we can see now we are close you're halving the GDP growth to maybe about 4%. So I think it makes sense for people to be more conservative and more cautious going into 2024. Uh, however, um, the economy is made out of many different parts. And if you were to invest, you would you'd be wiser to choose the right industries. For example, uh, the latest budget was quite neutral for most companies or most industries. Even let's say like construction is generally pretty neutral except for maybe areas like uh, Johor or Sarawak, you know, infrastructure spending and things like that. Um, but then certain areas are quite positive. For example, they are planning to build a, a new industrial park. Um, I believe this is in the northern region uh, in Perak. So the tech sector is a bit more exciting than other industries. So it's really industry based. Your second question on the capital gains tax, right now is mainly for unlisted companies, so private companies. They have not shared the details on how they would go about it, but they're saying there's going to be a 10% if there is a capital gains tax. And when you sell uh, the shares, government will take a piece of it. Several issues I see is that uh, it can be circumvented. You know, they can organize maybe a specific agreement that I sell to another person with no capital gains but in some other ways I get paid because in a private space it's uh, less transparent. Mm -hmm. The bigger, f there's no immediate impact on the stock market right now but there are two things we need to take note of. Is this merely just going to be for private companies or will this extend to public companies? I think that's the big fear because if it gets extended, the worry is that the, the people who are pro the capital gains tax will say, well, you know, advanced economies uh, tax have capital gains tax. The US have uh, 20, 15% or 20%, something like that. So what's wrong if we have 10%? Of course, the other side will say, well, but we are not as advanced as the US. So we shouldn't do that. Uh, there's also talks that there is a dividend tax as well. 
So also, I believe somewhere in that region of 10%, um, because that will tax uh, so-called rich people or T20 people. So uh, these are uh, definitely in, let's call it the capitalist class, they are worried about things like that. But as of now, there's no immediate impact. Mm, I see. Thank you for that. Okay, because this is uh, another question just popped in my head. Uh, yes. Because I understand you also run a channel with another two pe people. Yeah, uh, one more person. Yeah. Uh, no, no. On the watch one. Yes, the watch one. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Correct. Because I I remember that for our budget 2024, they have this luxury tax. Luxury yeah. Tax. Uh, Yes. Will it affect the value of the... I'm not sure whether it's yes. your territory's yeah. answer. Yeah. Maybe you can share a bit on that. I think the first thing to note for that is, uh, I think it's great that they should put taxes on luxury goods because the people affected will not... You know, it doesn't really matter, right? If you're rich, whether you buy your Hermes bag for 10,000... I'm not sure if the Hermes bag is 10,000 ringgit, but let's say it is. <laughs> Instead of pay, you know, you used to pay ten thousand ringgit. Now you have to pay thirteen thousand ringgit. Let's say to rich people, it's, it, you know, it's really nothing, right? That's probably what they pay their their secretaries. I wouldn't put too much hope for the government to generate a lot of revenue from this, simply because if you are a rich person and you realize that the taxes are quite high, uh, just fly to a country that has no taxes. Let's say Switzerland buy these luxury goods and I can give an anecdote I have a friend who wanted to buy a very expensive ring for the wife uh, for an engagement ring it was a Tiffany ring so you know how much mm -hmm. it costs right all ladies know it's the dream ring so instead of buying it here in Bukit Bintang he flew to Switzerland and buy it <coughs> and it's cheaper even when he factored in the flights so I'm generally in favor of the luxury tax Yes, you will raise the prices, but I wouldn't hope too much as far as revenue generation is concerned for the government. I see. Wow. Thank you for your insight. Yeah. I understand Adrian has some question for you too. Yes. Adrian, our founder. What do you see a, uh, the OPR hike in Malaysia and in US? Um, I wouldn't try to predict whether or not uh, both the US and Malaysia will raise their OPR, but I will give I'll explain how I think about the situation. So with the US, if you read the FOMC meeting notes, FOMC is just the committee that decides whether or not the interest rates go up or down. They mentioned that there is there are two, two to three different criteria and factors that they are looking at before they decide. The first is the inflation rate, so of course driven by the CPI. The second would be the unemployment rate. And the third would be uh, any wars and things like that. So about over the past year or, or two where they have been aggressively hiking the rates, uh, they felt comfortable to do that because number one, in, uh, inflation was high. So they needed to control it through interest rates. Second thing is that unemployment was quite low. Uh, the employment figures coming out of the US was actually very robust. Uh, you actually, and then on a qualitative level, you hear that there were a lot of people, it was quite bustling, right? So, and then, but they were a bit worried about the, the Russia-Ukraine war. But they felt it, that it was okay for them to uh, raise hikes, uh, what's the word? Hike rates aggressively. The situation today is one where I believe employment is not that much of an issue yet, or uh, now, but inflation has dropped quite a bit for the US. They hit a high of like eight, 9% perhaps, and then now it's closer to 4 or 3. But then you've got a new factor, which is uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, which can affect many, many things. So that, I explain it this way, it's not really an answer, but uh, the reason I bring this up is because uh, to show you how, why it's very difficult to predict, because there's all sorts of things moving on. Now, as far as Malaysia is concerned, what I can be quite confident in is that they will not match they have not matched the speed of uh, raising rates compared to the US uh, and it makes sense because we already had a higher interest rate compared to the US before they started raising rates. The US started raising at about 0.25% whereas Malaysia was already closer to maybe 2 odd percent. And also if Malaysia were to raise rates aggressively, uh, our property sector would 
be halved overnight, right? It will not be very pretty. So I give kudos to Bank Nagara for maintaining that discipline because it's very easy to, to cave in, to say, well, uh, big, big guy US is doing it, so we have to do it. Uh, of course, they've done it. They've managed to maintain the discipline in spite of the ringgit depreciating. So I have to commend them for that. So, but I doubt the pace of raising rates will be high for Malaysia if it does happen. What do you say about Malaysian economy in 2024? I think it will be more of the same. Uh, I think the tax sector will be a big driving force, um, especially for our exports. And I happen to think that, I don't know about oil prices in 2024, but looking at how the economy is moving, there's a good chance that oil prices will actually be higher as we the years go by. That will be somewhat beneficial, will be beneficial definitely for Malaysia. So our two largest exports are heading the right direction. As far as domestic economy, that's where I would be a bit more neutral, 50-50. Not sure if I answered your question okay. correctly. Uh, any any dividend yielding stocks that yeah. you feel is under the radar, means that it's yeah. not being promoted or being analyzed by analysts? Maybe you can share three of them. So the, the interesting thing about dividend yielding stocks is that they are easily discoverable. So it's very hard to find actually dividend yielding stocks that are not well covered. Mm -hmm. That is something to take note because a big part of the Malaysian stock market are run by your big funds like EPF, your Tabung Hajis of the world where they require a dividend yield. And so they are actively searching for these kind of companies. Uh, so I, I can't really answer that question whether there are a lot of companies that are dividend yielding, but also as uh, talked about. True, the, the penny stock, dividend yielding stocks that you favor, that you can suggest? I'm not sure this, I don't think this is a very high dividend yield stock, but it has decent dividends for a small company. Uh, I don't think it's a penny stock, but it's a small company. It's called Masterpack. They involved in the solar industry and they do wood pallets for the solar industry. They are a pretty well-run company. And uh, yeah, you guys can check it out and see whether you know it's something that you are interested in. But it's a pretty well-run company, and that pays dividends. And recently, I believe they paid a big amount of dividends. Mm. Any other stock that uh, any company that you, you can you can think of? La? One that I have in mind. Let me think. I think one that has caught my attention recently is uh, Yinsen. So this is not a this is a large company. They are involved in uh, the upstream of oil and gas. Uh, they do FPSOs. So they, when they dig the oil out of the ground, not they, when oil majors like your Petronas and Shells of this world, they get the oil out of the ground, they would then send this oil to a floating vessel that will you know, process some of the oil onshore. Mm. Uh, it's a cheaper alternative compared to processing it on the oil platform. Mm. So the company is involved uh, in that sort of services. And interestingly, they are a Malaysian company that is I believe almost 90% global. They are in areas like uh, South America, Vietnam, uh, Africa. So they are a very impressive company. And they started out doing just lorries, logistics. Then move on to floating vessels. And they are the top, probably top two, top three players uh, in the world. But any, any, any industries that um, you'll be focused on for next, uh, for next year? Well, as I said earlier on, oil and gas and technology, these are companies that I'm interested in. The, sec the third one would be uh, packaging. So my master pack is somewhat, somewhat like that. You know, the, the paper packaging guys are getting a little bit more interesting because of ESG. So ESG, they want to stay off plastics. We know the straws and all that, right? So even on the manufacturing level, let's say like your, your smartphone packaging when you receive it. Uh, in the past, when you open it up, inside there's a mold to fit your phone. Mm -hmm. In the past, it was maybe plastic. Uh, now you see a trend where people are going to use paper instead. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the trends that have been So packaging, oil and gas technology. Mm -hmm. Tech manufacturing specifically, yeah. No publishing. <laughs> <laughs> the only <laughs> okay. company that I can think of publishing, publishing. the closest is that uh, textbook company was at Pelican. 
uh, pelangi. Pelangi, ya. Yeah. Sasbadi. So, Sasbadi, yeah. There mm, you go. These are two biggest ones. Sasbadi, yeah. So, do you read a lot? Yes, yes, yes. I, I I used to read a lot more, but I still read a lot every day. Can, yeah. can you share with us one recent book that you read? One recent book, uh, I cannot remember, is by Patrick Bat David. It's called Five, Your Next Five Moves. Yes, it's a book about, I think it's about business strategy. It's just about strategy. Uh, it's all, uh, so, uh, Patrick Bat David, he runs a very successful YouTube channel. It's called Your Next Five Moves. I see. Because looking at your business nature, so where do you get the source of information? I mean, yeah. from, from what kind of channels? Do you read online? Do you read from papers? Do you read from. Yeah, uh, definitely both. But even if it was paper, it will be e-copy. You know, I think the edge is a very good. Uh, it's probably the best uh, source, especially for business news. I would say that they are a natural monopoly. They are that good, right? As a news source. But mainly, you know, on the ground, what you hear, your WhatsApp chats, people talking about it, uh, experts in the field, analysts, things like that. So we get a pulse of what's happening from these sources. Question, because you, you review about one, uh, review one of our books. Oh, which one? See, you said you read about Zilun. Zilun, yeah, yeah. How, how was that book? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say for the long answer, go watch my video. <laughs> But uh, yeah, generally positive. I texted. Uh, I don't have to do this number. I texted the Trade View guys because he works at Trade View, so I know uh, Zuhan, right? So I told Zuhan to pass on the message that uh, I thought the the book was really good. We have to put a link in the video. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. I like. I like the book. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Let's go. Oh, good. So